Okay, we'll be starting in about one minute. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's session of Greg McMillan's live process control seminar and demo series. We call these demonars for short. Today's topic is PID and PID plus split range control, how to reduce the discontinuity, nonlinearity, and oscillations across the split range point. The broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. And we'll be muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box to ask your questions, and I'll relay them verbally to him during the course of today's session. And uh, throw, fire away your questions as they occur. With that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us today. Uh, these uh, demonars are sponsored by Emerson, Xperia Tech, Monsanto, and Amina Simulation Technologies. They were created by uh, me and Jack Ehlers. Uh, Jack is a control specialist at Monsanto. And uh, the Process Control Lab website uh, was uh, designed and, uh, main, and is uh, maintained by uh, Charlie Schleiser of uh, CS Design Co. Uh, well, this is me, and you probably know me by now. Um, I am the um, Automation Week Program Committee Chairperson, and i um, kind of excited about the possibilities here. The emphasis is on making this a technical conference instead of an expo like it has been in previous years. Um, and uh, so what we're looking for is uh, getting uh, the best people uh, to share their knowledge. Uh, the call for papers deadline is coming up here. It's uh, March 28th. It's going to be in uh, Mobile. Uh, at the convention center that's uh, sitting right on the waterfront. It's a beautiful facility with uh, lots of balconies uh, for sitting outside and discussing process control and enjoying the weather and, uh, and the waterfront. We're really excited about the fact uh, that we have uh, control system legends, Charlie Cutler and Bella Litbeck, uh, to give us keynote talks. And uh, Charlie Cutler will present uh, the status of uh, real-time optimization and model predictive control. And Bell Liptak will present the present and future role of automation, uh, the maturing of profession. In addition, uh, we have uh, myself, Terry Tolliver, and Russ Reinhardt uh, and joining uh, Charlie Cutler and Bell Liptak in a general session um, panel discussion on the present and future of automation worldwide. Uh, the keynotes in the general session are each uh, 90 minutes in length, and in the general session, each panelist will provide a 10-minute perspective followed by a 40-minute uh, Ask the Experts uh, discussion. And so we're encouraging uh, the attendees to uh, ask the panel questions in order to get a better understanding of the future implications for their professions and applications, and give them more tools to making informed business decisions. Um, you know, these panel members are all, uh, have been inducted into the Process Automation Hall of Fame. Uh, I think that their reputations speak for themselves, and so I feel that this is an incredible once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to gain the insights and experience of a truly unique unique group of uh, leading innovators in process optimization. I uh, hope to see you there. Well, um, 
Here we got the top 10 signs of an excellent operator training system. Uh, you know, the operators are probably one of our biggest resources that we don't pay enough attention to. So, in the top 10 signs of an excellent OTS, uh, number 10, plant production rate is higher than the model. Boy, that would be nice. And the model is such an ideal view of things. Online yield metrics are off scale high. Operators postpone vacations, get more time on the OTS. Operators do an opportunity assessment of process control improvements. Operators are more interested in the process than donuts. That'd be incredible. Operators invite automation engineers on fishing trips to discuss control strategies. Calendars in the break room feature a control strategy of the month. Operators take the ISA exam to be a certified automation professional, CAP. Like executives hang out in the control room to learn more about process control. And the number one sign of an excellent operator training system which, uh, by the way, is um, online here for the Control Talk column in the February issue of Control Magazine, um, titled Operators Unleashed uh, at this link. And the number one sign is uh, executives ask operators to order their screen prints of online process metrics. So we have a new split range lab here, a lab four, and uh, the PID output is split, is split <laughs> between multiple final control elements. These could be dampers, valves, and variable frequency drives. Um, they could also be heaters, uh, but we're going to be uh, working with control valves. So well, here we have a splitter, and uh, it's splitting the controller output between control valve uh, one and two, both of which uh, uh, are inputs, um, provide input flows to the secondary process. And then we have a single loop here for control. In the splitter detail, we've uh, added quite a bit of flexibility here to uh, set what these valves are in terms of gains and biases and uh, uh, also in, a, in terms of uh, something uh, innovative and in that um, we know that the friction increases as you get closer and closer to the seat and so what I've done is put in a calculation uh, where the uh, stiction uh, and specifically then the resolution of the control valve um, uh, the, gets worse as you get closer to the seat and so you take whatever uh, stick step size for the resolution limit that you've entered here and uh, when you're inside the zone here uh, you're increasing it uh, so as the stroke gets lower and you're subtracting that from the zone uh, you add a, a multiplier here and um, for our case uh, where we have the zone starting at 20 percent um, uh, we could have a stick slip uh, right near the seat that is 20 plus 1, 21 times uh, what the stick, uh, stick is uh, when we're in a normal throttle range. And we don't have a whole lot of data on this because uh, when we ask a control valve manufacturer to test a valve, uh, they will test at 50% open, and uh, they don't want to do the tests, uh, particularly below 20%. So that was kind of the clue there was a problem. And then you kind of start to think about things and go back on your experience and what you have seen, and you realize that 20% um, is kind of a good number for as an indication of when you start to get into increased friction. And that's true for um, uh, a lot of different types of valves, whether it's sliding stem or rotary valves. Uh, then I've had a, a convenient parameter to to uh, set the valve's operating point uh, so that I can ha determine how close or how far away uh, it is uh, from the split range point. And, um, and that's uh, set right here for the secondary load. Uh, you can set the splitter um, uh, split range here by uh, an input array and uh, also an output array. 
So what are the split range applications? Um, uh, you have the high rangeability flow uh, one where we have small and large valves in parallel and at low loads we're throttling the small valve and then through the split range when we get to the high loads we are uh, requiring high flows so we're throttling the large valve. Um, and so um, it's stated as a rangeability problem, but we'll see that it's more really of a sensitivity problem and that if we had uh, the right uh, characteristic, installed characteristic, and extremely sensitive valve, we could really turn that valve down and throttle very tiny flows. But given our limitations, we end up uh, with a, a, a small valve to try and get uh, to uh, the low flow requirement. We also have another split range application where we have uh, different final control elements. And I guess uh, in general, split range uh, ends up where you have more than one final control element. Here we have different ones. So we have, say, a damper and a variable frequency drive. And, and that's uh, a common situation for flow and pressure control. Then we have opposing effects. So we're manipulating two flows with opposing effects. Uh, for example, we've got uh, coolant and steam valves uh, for reactor temperature control because uh, maybe you have to heat it up uh, in the beginning, but then when the reaction takes off, you need to uh, cool it off. Uh, we have acid and reagent valves for neutralizer uh, pH control. And if you're talking about bioreactors for pH control, we actually have a carbon dioxide and sodium uh, bicarbonate uh, involved. And um, uh, finally, for uh, vessel pressure control, we have vent uh, and nitrogen uh, valves. Now, if you're oscillating across the split range point, and say you're going from coolant to steam valves, you're wasting energy. If you're going back and forth between the acid and base valves, you're cross-neutralizing your reagents and wasting reagent. And uh, for bioreactor control, um, going across back and forth uh, between carbon dioxide and sodium bicarbonate, um, while it, it, it wastes reagents, the bigger issue is uh, you can be adding too much carbon dioxide, and of course the cells themselves give off carbon dioxide, and if you end up with too, too much carbon dioxide, uh, you know that's not good for living cells. Uh, the other thing is if you uh, going back and forth and you keep adding sodium bicarbonate when you really don't need it, and you're adding it because you added too much carbon dioxide, um, and the sodium, the salt uh, that gets in there, increases the cell pressure. While this isn't an exact analogy, but we know that salt in our bodies increases our pressure. Well, salt inside uh, uh, these, uh, getting into these living cells increases the pressure within the cells, and it can get so great that it can burst the cells, uh, burst called uh, cell lysis, uh, where the cell breaks apart, and of course then it dies. And if you're um, going between vent and nitrogen valves, um, may, you're wasting nitrogen, but maybe more importantly, uh, you're overloading your vent system. Then we also have uh, uh, probably a less common case, but important, where we have significantly different costs for the manipulated flows. We may have a waste fuel and a purchase fuel for a, a boiler. And we may have a waste reagent and purchase reagent for pH control. And naturally, you want to use as much as the waste uh, instead of um, the purchased uh, stuff. That's obvious. Uh, you may have recycled versus a purchased rea reactant for composition control. Again, you want to use as much as the recycle as possible. And then uh, you may have uh, something here in the pulp and paper industry, uh, low and high cost chemicals for kappa number control uh, for um, paper brightness. So what are the split range problems? Well, first of all, there's the nonlinear installed characteristic. You have a flattening at the high end of the valve stroke, and the minimum flow at the low end of the valve stroke range 
um, uh, is also a problem in both of these. The flattening and the minimum flow increase as the ratio of the valve to system pressure drop decreases. And in order to save energy, um, people are advocating uh, allocating less and less pressure drop uh, to the control valve, making this ratio smaller and smaller. And in fact, uh, you know, some statements are, oh, you can make it uh, 0.05 or 5 percent of the system uh, pressure drop. And uh, while uh, the valve may work, it, it works only over a limited range. You've lost uh, rangeability. And uh, you've created some uh, problems where you may be uh, riding the seat at uh, low flows, and you may have lost sensitivity uh, because of that flattening of the characteristic at high flows. And we'll see that in a minute here with an installed characteristic. Uh, low cost flow is often slower and more erratic, making, making tight control difficult. So you can't just like try and rely upon a low cost flow often to do your, your tight control. You've got to come in with the higher cost stuff to take care of, uh, you know, these disturbances quickly, but then you're always trying to maximize the use of the low cost stuff. And so, for example, the bark and lime are slow and uh, the waste and recycle streams have unpredictable compositions. Um, a larger limit cycle for the larger valve or damper. Uh, since stick slip is a percent of stroke, and thus if you have a bigger valve you, and you have this, even the same percent stick slip, you're going to have a bigger amount of flow associated with that stick slip. Now, consequently, the flow limit cycle is larger for the larger valve. Uh, this has particularly implications for when we are doing that classic split range uh, to achieve rangeability. And at high flows, we're only throttling the high valve. Now we have a big stick slip in terms of flow and big limit cycles. And um, we'll see that there's a way around that uh, and that uh, we really should be addressing the sensitivity requirement. Uh, one of the other things to realize is that there is high seal and seat friction near the closed position. As I mentioned, you get below 20 percent, and the stick slip can be an order of magnitude greater. Um, it's uh, particularly bad for tight show off rotary valves that were originally designed, say, for on-off service or for isolation service, for safety instrumentated systems, for patch sequencing, and somebody puts a positioner on them and tries to sell it to you as a throttle valve. Then you have wire drawing uh, of the internal element and seating surfaces near the closed position. And when we're at a split range point, we're, we're typically at a closed position of one or more of the valves. And we get these high velocities that cause uh, streamline cracks and erosion of the surfaces. We can also have flashing uh, when the vena contractor pr pressure drops below the vapor pressure, causing choking and vibration. Uh, then near the closed seat, um, we can have high breakaway and unbalanced forces. Um, and if we were kind of marginal in our actuator sizing, and I have to warn you now, when you go out for bids, in order to save size, uh, the the control valve uh, manufacturer may be providing a marginal actuator, and marginal in terms of maybe having some problems here near the seat with these uh, high breakaway and unbalanced forces, and also in terms of uh, the amount of stick slip you're going to see. And uh, so you have to, if you're going to be at a split range point, um, you have to be uh, careful that you do not have marginal sized actuators. Um, and um, we'll talk about that more later. Manipulated flows have uh, different uh, process dynamics. So, you know, if you're manipulating steam versus chilled water, carbon dioxide versus sodium bicarbonate, there's a different process gain, dead time, and time constant. Um, and um, this is uh, something that can be uh, truly uh, significant and, of course, um, messes up the tuning of the controller. And then something you don't hear about that's a very practical problem is steam shock. Uh, as you go from the coolant to the uh, to the steam, there's a steam pressure wave and the water droplets, then the 
Um, there, it causes uh, an erratic, maybe being blown against a temperature measurement, um, and can cause some erratic uh, readings. And so uh, the idea is you have to address um, how you uh, move into adding steam and uh, where is the temperature uh, sensor uh, in respect to where the steam is added. Well, the essential problem is uh, nearly all split range loops oscillate across the split range point, wearing out valves, wasting resources, and increasing process variability. We talked about the uh, problem with uh, install characteristics, and here uh, what I'm showing you for the very popular equal percentage characteristic for um, different ratios here of um, valve drop to system drop, uh, we have different installed characteristics. And uh, if you have uh, allocated a lot of pressure drop uh, to your valve, so you have characteristic number one here, uh, you're pretty close to the equal percentage characteristic, and your minimum flow is down here, and you don't get any flattening um, up here uh, above, um, uh, say, 90%. Now, if you want to save a lot of energy and you go with, you know, the manufacturer's control valve says, hey, you want to save money? Um, I don't want you to buy that variable speed drive. So here, uh, you know, only allocate maybe 5% or 6% uh, of the system pressure drop to the control valve. Well, then uh, your minimum flow is up here. And uh, notice as you get up uh, uh, at the above 90%, you have some flattening of the characteristic. And um, this doesn't look too bad, but if you are considering a butterfly valve, uh, this would be dramatic, the flattening. And, in fact, the flattening would be significant as you get um, maybe more than 50% open. And, again, as you're allocating less and less pressure drop, uh, the flattening moves to lower and lower positions. And it could occur for even 40% uh, open uh, for those uh, situations where you're trying to save um, energy. Um, there are limit cycles from stick slip and, and, and backlash, and I don't propose to go into these equations just to show you that there are equations and you can predict the amplitude. Um, and, um, and they de it depends principally upon, in this case, restriction, uh, things like uh, the controller gain and then also uh, the open loop gain in the system, which uh, is product of the valve process and measurement gain. The measurement gain is simply 100% divided by the span of the measurement. Um, and also, oh, yeah, the period uh, depends upon also the interval time. Uh, notice uh, that the amplitude, though, uh, doesn't depend upon tuning. It's, it's fixed by... Uh, the uh, open loop gain and the amount of uh, stick slip that you have. Now, uh, you're going to have stiction limit cycles if you have one integrator anywhere, whether it's in the process or in the control system. Uh, with backlash, you'll get limit cycles if you have two integrators. Uh, they can be anywhere, whether they're in uh, the process or or in the control system. The classic you know, case cited is you have a level process that's integrating and you put a PID controller and you have interval action the controller, you have two integrators, now you have a limit cycle. Here the limit cycle amplitude uh, uh, does depend upon the controller gain. And again, uh, the period of the oscillation uh, depends upon both the interval time and uh, the controller gain. Uh, so if you really want to see uh, uh, you know, relatively the effects of uh, your tuning and uh, stick slip and backlash. Uh, this gives you the limit cycle period and amplitude. So what are the split range solutions? Well, there's a lot of them. Uh, we can eliminate the split range. That's always good if you can eliminate the whole problem to begin with. Uh, and you can do that for rangeability uh, situations and different costs, you know, where we had small and large valves or uh, flows that were either high or low cost. And we can do that, um, and this first solution is not all that popular, but it, it's out there. Uh, a proportional only control of the small valve or the high cost flow. And then you go with PID control 
uh, of a large valve or low pulse flow. The idea is if you had two PID controllers working um, to try and maintain the process variable at set point, they'd be fighting each other. But if you go with one of them being proportional only and not having interval action, um, it will minimize the amount of uh, interaction that's and fighting that's going on. Uh, probably the more common solution, although you may not even have heard of this one, is to eliminate uh, the split range for rangeability by a valve position controller that positions a large valve or a low cost flow to keep the small valve or high cost flow that's manipulated uh, by the process PID in the best throttle range. And uh, if you're talking about high cost flows, uh, we naturally would want a minimum throttle position for the high cost flow. If we're talking about just doing rangeability, we'd probably pick a, um, um, a, a middle uh, position, say around 40 or 50 percent uh, as the desirable position for uh, the small valve, uh, which has the smaller limit cycle and maybe it's faster as well. If we're talking about the large valve being really big, it can be a lot slower. Um, if uh, Here uh, we're going to be using an interval only controller for the valve position controller, again to, to deal with this uh, interaction issue and the, and the interval action is set to be much slower um, correction of large valve uh, than what you get in terms of the process PID uh, manipulating the small valve. And that's the idea um, that you can use to reduce the interaction. However, then um, this very slow interval only action of the valve position controller um, doesn't do well with fast disturbances, large disturbances. So you need a smart proportion feed for control to help um, that solution in particular, and also solution number one. And in general, it may be a good idea to have uh, the feed forward control get you on the right valve and have the right valve take um, the most of the disturbance. Um, we can use model predictive control for, uh, for this rangeability uh, and different costs to eliminate the split range altogether. and. Um, uh, I published an article, Model Predictive Control Can Solve Valve Problem, and that's at this link here in, uh, for the Control Magazine. And then there's application notes one and two on the use of model predictive control for these applications here that you can look at. Um, and one of the things, you know, we, we realized uh, as I was getting into this is that uh, the enhanced PID, PID plus, uh, with a wireless uh, trigger level and noise bands set for patients at the split range point and to ignore feed forward timing errors, which was a subject of a previous seminar, uh, and, uh, and also offers the ability uh, to reduce limit cycles, which we saw in a previous uh, seminar as well from, uh, from uh, just valve stick slip and backlash. And so we think the PID Plus has some advantages here. It also uh, reduces uh, interaction if you're going to go with uh, solutions uh, one and two. One of the other things you can do is use velocity limit and dynamic reset limit to slow down the transition into uh, the split range point. And um, also maybe have a smarter correction being provided by the valve position controller. Um, of course, uh, one of the things that you ought to be doing just to minimize the, the source of the problem is go with precise valves. And this means a sliding stem, unless you're getting to very large valves, um, say greater than uh, 8 inch, with uh, diaphragm actuators and digital positioners. Um, the splitter uh, would be best if it would set a flow controller instead of going directly to the valves. Uh, so they could isolate the installed characteristic and its nonlinearity from the process controller. And so the flow controller would take care of it. And so the idea here is the split output becomes the set point for flow controllers instead of becoming a signal to uh, valves. Um, you should choose the split range uh, point intelligently to compensate for differences in the valve and process gain. Um, and uh, finally, if, particularly if you have these opposing media, 
uh, like steam and uh, chilled water and um, carbon dioxide and sodium bicarbonate, nitrogen and vent. Uh, uh, you really need adaptive tuning and control to schedule the tuning as a function of the uh, PID output. Well, let's go back to the split range point that we can eliminate. First of all, we can make the split range point uh, smarter. Uh, it's smarter in terms of the valve gain, uh, but we still haven't addressed the valve sensitivity problem by going with this solution. But uh, I wanted to talk about, um, in general, we should have smarter split range points. Right now, the split range point is set at 50%. It really ought to be set based on the valve and process gain. And so we have a split range uh, block here called the splitter. And it, uh, it is used to determine uh, when the small valve is throttled and uh, also uh, when the large valve is throttled and uh, to what degree. And we can set up um, the splitter uh, so that when the PID output is 0%, uh, both small and large valves are closed. When it, um, has increased to 20%, now we have completely st stroked the uh, small valve, but uh, still uh, the large valve is uh, closed. And, and that's the situation here. We don't have any gap <coughs> specified. But when we get to 100%, now we have stroked uh, the large valve 100% open. By making the span of the controller output associated with the throttling of a valve, of uh, being, uh, for the, in this case, for the large valve, uh, four times larger, because we're going from 20 to 100 percent, that's an 80 percent span, versus the small valve, where we're going from zero to 20, that's a 20 percent span. What we're doing is we're compensating for the fact that the large valve is four times uh, uh, the flow capacity of the small valve. So um, the smart Split range point can be calculated here uh, based on uh, valve uh, gains or uh, valve number uh, for valve one and process one and the valve gain and process gain for valve number two. And so this gives you what portion or what span of the BID output associated with valve one, uh, what span of uh, the PID output is associated with valve two. Again, if we got a zero to hundred percent PID output and we have a gap, we've got uh, this equation here. If we substitute uh, this equation into the first equation, we end up with uh, this final equation here for calculating an intelligent uh, split range point, uh, where S1 being the span of the first one really is also the split range point. So this came out to be 20% for that last uh, example. Now here's solution one that addresses the sensitivity problem. The sensitivity probably being being like, it, you know, given that you've got a sensitivity resolution from stick slip, um, a stiction, um, that uh, for the small valve um, is a much smaller flow, uh, you want to take advantage of that uh, for uh, for uh, process control. And so um, you can have two PID controllers, but uh, as you've shown here uh, in the classical solution stated in the literature uh, from, say, a long time ago, like the 1970s, uh, you would have uh, a PID controller over here on the large valve, and uh, over here on the small valve, you'd have a proportional thing. And uh, the interaction of these is somewhat minimized proportional only control. Uh, an alternative here is to use the PID plus with a sensitivity limit. Uh, and uh, also here as well. And this uh, it has the added benefit of eliminating uh, the limit cycles, uh, which are particularly bad for this large valve, but also helps reduce the interaction uh, between these two controllers. And yet, if the added benefit of now having integral action when you really need it for the small valve. And you can set the sensitivity limit here um, to um, 
to, to help minimize interactions uh, on uh, both of these controllers. In other words, um, uh, you can take advantage of the fact that maybe uh, for small changes, uh, the small valve can take care of uh, the problem. And for big changes, you'd have the big valve involved. Um, now, for the more um, common, although it's not that well-known solution, we have uh, an integral-only valve position uh, controller here. And uh, what it is doing, it's taking uh, the output of your process controller, that's a PID controller, you know, and it's saying, well, um, I want to manipulate uh, this large valve here very slowly through integral-only action so that I keep my small valve in a good uh, throttle position, say uh, maybe around 40%. Um, but it ha has to be slow, and in fact, uh, one of the guide or rule of thumb statements is, is the interval time of this valve position controller here uh, should be uh, 10 times greater than the product of uh, the uh, reset time and gain of this controller. So that it's 10 times slower in doing this positioning, repositioning of the big valve uh, compared to the speed at which the process controller is uh, doing its uh, manipulation of the small valve um, to keep, in this case, your pH at the right set point. So, well, there's the problem. If it's slow, it means that big disturbances are going to cause a problem, and that's why you need feed forward. Now, an alternative is to use the PID plus with a sensitivity limit for both of these controllers. And um, it has the added benefit, as uh, stated before, eliminating limit cycles, but also reducing interaction and uh, providing uh, correction on using interval action and, and maybe faster when there is a big disturbance. And, uh, be looking at uh, these possibilities in more detail at a future, at the next seminar, actually, when we get into how to use PID uh, control for sustainable manufacturing. Uh, here's the nomenclature for those equations. If you want to uh, dig into those equations in more detail, actually use them. Um, now let's go to the split range uh, demo in number one, and I'm going to share my desktop for that. So uh, this is the new lab, and we've added a splitter block uh, that now um, splits the PID controller output between control valve 1 and control valve 2. Both of those feed into the secondary process. <clears throat> and uh, so here um, for uh, the demo number 1, uh, we're going to show the effect of a standard uh, split range point, uh, you know, being 50%. Uh, that's where I would say 99% uh, of split range loops uh, uh, have their split range point, right, at 50%. Um, that's what the operators are used to. So now if you do a smarter one, you're going to have to do a little bit of operator, operator training, make sure you display what the actual valves are doing. Um, but I think the smarter, we'll see the smarter one does have some advantages. So we're going to verify that, yes, the uh, the splitter um, block is set for a split range point of 50%. Um, and uh, then we're going to, uh, we're going to open up the faceplate and also uh, we're going to open up the chart. And uh, everything's fine here. Um, now we're going to um, uh, vary the load, and uh, low load, uh, we're on the small valve here, and we're just going to vary the load between 5 and 15 percent and see how we're doing here um, when we're on the small valve. Again, this is uh, the classic application of using split range to, to achieve what we think is a better range ability, um, but um, we haven't addressed uh, the sensitivity issue. Um, or uh, the intelligence of the split range point selection. So uh, we've made a low disturbance here, and uh, let's see how it, it does.
Well, not bad. It's uh, coming back to set point here uh, rather smoothly. So at low loads, uh, when we're on the small valve, um, we're tuned up pretty nicely. And uh, we're not, you know, overly aggressive here. Uh, we're not oscillating. We just have a nice, slow, gradual, well, not real slow, but we have a gradual good approach uh, back to set point uh, for that load. But let's uh, now uh, go ahead and uh, look at um, what happens uh, for uh, higher loads when we're forced to go uh, to the bigger valve. And so we're going to increase the load to 35% to force us uh, onto uh, the bigger valve. And you can see from the controller output here, um, split range being point being at 50%, <clears throat> we are on the bigger valve. Now, we don't have any stick split, <laughs> stick, <laughs> stick slip. Say that and split real uh, quickly together. Um, so any oscillations we're getting here is not due to stick split, <laughs> stick slip, but as uh, it's just due to the fact that when we're on the bigger valve, we have a bigger valve gain, and now the tuning isn't right because we don't have a smart uh, split range point. And so you can see the oscillations right there. And uh, if we uh, change the load and go up to 45%, uh, uh, we just see that we t continue to have oscillations and uh, with the loop trying to deal with this. <coughs> So uh, now you could retune the loop. You could do some gain scheduling to take care of this. Uh, or uh, you can go with a uh, smarter split range point. So in the splitter detail, uh, we're going to set uh, the smarter split range point so that uh, the portion of uh, of the controller PID output uh, for the large valve is uh, four times uh, what it is for the small valve because my large valve is about four times uh, larger than the small valve. And so I just need to change that split range point from 50 to 20 percent and do that here as well. And um, we'll see uh, how it does. We don't need to really check the response for low loads uh, because we know that was okay before. It's okay now. Uh, we're just going to check the response here at the high loads. And, uh, of course, changing the split range point did introduce an upset, uh, which we can see. Uh, but um, we've really uh, reduced uh, significantly uh, the amount of the oscillation. And uh, we can make a, another load change here and um, see how well it performs. With a smarter split range point. Yeah, pretty good. Okay. So now we're going to see the effect of uh, stick slip. Right now we have a perfect valve. Uh, we're going to use the same uh, smart split range point, so, you know, uh, that's not the issue. Uh, we're going to check and verify that our splitter zones are 20%. And now we're going to introduce, due to stiction, uh, a resolution step, uh, uh, minimum step size of uh, 0.5%. Uh, and then we're going to set the uh, low to 25% near the split range point and 
and uh, check what's happening. So uh, let's go and check, uh, first of all, the splitter. And uh, our zones are 20%, uh, so we're okay there. Uh, we are going to go to control valve 1 now. And for uh, the step size, the re which is really the resolution limit, so we're going to put in 0.5%. And this could be considered a good valve. Um, in fact, uh, the ISA standard um, doesn't involve, I think, step checking for step sizes smaller than a half a percent. And put that in here as well. So uh, now we have some stiction in both these cases. Uh, uh, but now we, we want to get near uh, the split range point. And so uh, we're going to change the load here for the splitter down to 25%. Uh, And we'll see uh, what happens. And it's going to take a while for uh, the limit cycle to develop. And that's one of the confusing things. And we really have a slow process. Uh, people may not even realize the limit cycle because uh, the period is so large and other things can be happening. Of course, there's noise, but there's disturbances. And so the limit cycle period may, uh, oscillation may not be uh, so noticeable. Um, but um, in our case, uh, we don't have uh, other things going on right now. And you can uh, see uh, the start of the limit cycle. And here, um, you know, we're working around here around 25%. Well, now we're up at 30%. Anyway, um, let me talk about something while this is going on here that's a kind of a thing I learned in the last couple of years, actually while I was doing the book, The Essentials of Modern Measurements, and, uh, uh, there, there is a difference uh, between uh, sensitivity and resolution, but people don't try and make the distinction, but it can be important. Um, and um, today we tend to, you know, not as pay as much attention uh, to terms as we should. And I would encourage you to get the ISA dictionary um, that has these terms all completely, well, not completely, but uh, defined uh, in a lot of detail uh, with some examples. Uh, a lot of effort went into that. And so for sensitivity, what we're saying, there's a threshold. And... Um, and that the, in this case, the, the actual valve stroke uh, doesn't respond um, until, oops, I can't move that around, until um, it, it exceeds the threshold and then it jumps up and will match up with the valve signal. The key is once you exceed the threshold, it will go as far as it needs to to match up with the valve signal. And whether we're talking about valves or measurements, the sensitivity has uh, that sort of uh, characteristic. And there are some interesting implications uh, associated with that. And, uh, because uh, we often just talk about uh, resolution. And resolution says, yes, you have to exceed a, a certain change in signal. But once I exceed that, I'm only going to make a change according to that resolution limit. So I'm only going to do a step um, of the amount of size that is the resolution limit. And therefore, there's times where it doesn't really match up. In this case, the actual stroke does not match up with the valve signal. So resolution limit is really worse than the sensitivity limit. Um, and in the valve uh, response testing for ISA, they call uh, it a resolution limit. When, uh, when I've been digging into this, I'm not so sure. In fact, a lot of stiction may show up more as a sensitivity limit. And when we are talking about wireless trigger levels, we're talking about sensitivity limits, even though sometimes it's talk is said to be a resolution limit or even dead band. Dead band, um, and the definition of that is for backlash, where uh, if you're changing directions, uh, you have to move through the dead band before you get a change in 
uh, value. Uh, so uh, that's a third confusing term that unfortunately is just kind of thrown in there, and so indiscriminately people are using the terms resolution and, uh, and dead ban and uh, not really making the proper distinction. Okay, so we go here to demo number four, and we're keeping everything the same, uh, but we are going to set uh, a sensitivity limit here on the measurement, and we're going to set that at one percent. And uh, with that being done, we are going to enable PID plus. And we're going to see what happens. We had this limit cycle, and, uh, you know, it's, it would go on forever. You can't eliminate a limit cycle with tuning. You can change uh, uh, the period. And if it's due to backlash, you can also change the amplitude. Uh, but you can't get rid of it. And, uh, and what we have here um, is the fact that um, just by turning on uh, the PID plus, uh, we have uh, essentially killed the limit cycle. Uh, what's nice about this is, uh, you know, there's no uh, judgment as to what, the, say, an integral dead band would need to be set out, which is another solution. Uh, that That's based on you knowing what is uh, the amount of stick slip or backlash uh, that you got there. That's not required here. All we're doing is setting a sensitivities uh, above any noise, so, and which is a good idea anyway to not react to noise. And uh, so here uh, we can see uh, that we've lined out. And uh, that's the end of the demo, so we'll go back to our uh, seminar. So uh, to kind of wrap this up, uh, here are my recommendations. Uh, use smart split range point. It compensates for gross differences in manipulated flows. And even if you're going to do adaptive control, I advise this, because it makes the job a lot easier for the adaptive controller. It can then concentrate more on some nonlinearities and process effects. Uh, I would use cascade control, where the splitter output is the flow controller set point. It isolates the valve nonlinearity from the process PID. Uh, I would use valve position control to increase sensitivity and uh, rangeability. I'd use a smart proportion load and set point feed forward to get you on the right valve uh, with the right amount of um, uh, compensation for uh, a disturbance. I would use precise control valves with a valve drop greater than 25% of the system drop. And I would use twice the actuator size um, that uh, the manufacturer says you need. And if you go back to uh, the control top columns in November and December, uh, Hunter Vegas, who's a very experienced uh, project lead, um, uh, says that as well. And I, I if you talk to, uh, you know, people that have been out there that, you know, seen the consequences of a slightly marginal actuator, this is a simple a cost, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars more. But, boy, uh, it, 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 the cost of the process uh, that, uh, that you're uh, eliminating uh, in terms of process uh, oscillations, you know, and in terms of redu uh, improving process efficiency, and even the wear on tear on the valve. I mean, you know, we're talking about maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know, a few hundred dollars, uh, you know, we, we need to be uh, intelligent about those type of decisions. Use PID plus with the sensitivity set to ignore significant measurement and valve changes and also to ignore noise. It eliminates uh, limit cycles, reduces transitions across the split range point, reduces valve position control interactions. 
Uh, use smart uh, digital velocity and reset limiting. Uh, we haven't gotten into that, but we will in a future webinar to avoid uh, uh, unnecessary excursions and slow down excursions into the split range point, um, particularly if we're trying to avoid cross neutralization or alternating between uh, coolant and steam and wasting energy. Um, Use smart directional velocity and dynamic reset limit to slow down valve position control to avoid unnecessary uh, corrections and reduce interaction. This goes hand in hand with a with a PID plus um, mount uh, jacket temperature sufficiently downstream to reduce steam shock. If you mount it on the outlet of the jacket, so far as the temperature control inside the reactor, the dynamics are the uh, relatively the same. Um, the only thing it, it won't see maybe changes in chill water temperature as soon, but maybe the bigger issue here is eliminating the erratic action around the split range point by having the temperature sensor at the inlet of the jacket uh, and particularly too close to where you're introducing uh, steam. For opposing manipulated flows, uh, use adaptive tuning and control to compensate for changes in process gain, dead time, and time constant. Well, I encourage you to visit our, our process control lab website, and coming soon will be uh, Lab 4. Uh, we, we think it has all of these advantages, um, and our access now is... Uh, Easy, free, uh, eliminates the IT security issues and uh, the remote access response delays. All right, thank you, Greg. Um, I guess before we open it up, I put in the question and answer box a link to the this particular URL. Would love any feedback that you have for us. And our next one we're going to have on June 8th, Wednesday, 10 a.m. Central, and UTC, I think we're into daylight hours. I think it's 1,500, but uh, we'll double-check as we get closer. And the subject of that will be PID control for sustainable manufacturing, how PID features can increase process efficiency and capacity and provide environmental and property protection. And we'll be taking this seminar from today and creating a recording and uploading it and have it available both on Greg's modelingandcontrol.com blog and my Emerson Process Experts blog. So with that, uh, we'll open the floor and see if there's any questions. All right, we didn't get a question, but a comment uh, with a thanks to you, Greg, and uh, first time that uh, all the concepts you presented were well understood. You keep improving <laughs> with age there, so. Oh, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. It's a work in progress. <laughs> that's right. We, we keep trying to get these better and better. So thanks to everyone for attending, and we look forward to uh, having you join us on June 8th. Have a great day.